I'm going to show you what I think from a medical doctor perspective I can ju justify, document, um, and intervene for productively um, that almost always has a, um, a beneficial effect for the children. Um, oxidative stress. This is the Fantastic Four. Uh, and if you remember four things from my lecture, I want you to remember these four things. Not only just what they are, but what have you done to document them in your child, and what are you going to do to repair those in your child. Now, I apologize, I did send slides. Honestly, I really did send slides. Um, but what's in there is the biomarker paper that will include a lot of how we diagnose these things and something about treatment related to them. If you need these slides, we'll be happy to get them to you, in, or they'll be on the website, right? Oh, yeah. yes, we do. Okay, so they'll be on the Autism Today website, um, so you can pull them up there. And if you need supporting literature for this, um, help for your local pediatrician, just arrange that with us. So oxidative stress, we'll define these things later, but just write these down. These are your, you have to leave my lecture today with an understanding of these and a game plan to uh, define and treat and intervene if they're present in your child. Methylation and transsulfation, and we chose that guy from the Fantastic Four movie, if you've seen the movie, because he's the one that can kind of change shape, and this is how uh, the body rearranges its chemistry. Immunologically, um, made sense to, to pick the female out of the group since mom provides all of the passive immunity to child for the, uh, while in the womb and certainly for about six months after birth if there's no breastfeeding and much longer if there is breastfeeding. And then obviously he qualifies as the heavy metal guy. So you can remember using these kind of visual images, um, this sort of picture. And I, I think it makes it much easier to understand and, and put a word picture together with these things. Ken Olden is a good friend of mine. Peggy Giannini, who was the um, older pediatrician at the end of the movie, by the way, um, is typical of older pediatricians that I've talked to. Um, they're like elder statesmen. They're uh, oftentimes very open-minded. They recognize that they don't have all the answers, and they also know that they didn't see autism as a problem in the 50s and 60s when they were in the peak of their early practicing after medical school and residency. It just wasn't an issue for them. In the like fashion, if I talk to older teachers who have a lot of gray hair, um, they didn't see children with autism in their classrooms. They didn't see much ADHD back in the 60s and seven, early 70s. They saw it emerge as time went on as a bigger and bigger issue for kids. And that's telling us something uh, about our environment. And that's where Ken Olden's comments, he's the past director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Services and was a true inspiration in my career, said this, extensive and yet still emerging data support immunotoxicological mechanisms in autism spectrum disorders. The older, strictly genetic model is no longer valid. It is being replaced by our understanding of the diverse environmental insults impacting various genetic susceptibilities and epigenetic phenomena. That's a very complex for saying that there is a gene-environment interaction and that autism is not merely a genetic disorder in the traditional sense, irrespective of the garbage that you may hear put forward by supported experts. There's no way in the world that autism is purely a genetic disease. And any geneticist worth his, his degree understands that a negative gene, which autism by definition would have to be, because a negative gene is a gene that confers negative reproductive or disadvantage on the species. Anybody think that children with autism are going to reproduce at the same rate as their non-autistic peers? No, sadly. So therefore, for this gene to represent what it does now, and I'll show you the data on the, on the prevalence that's new data from the U.S. that just came out, for it to represent perhaps one in 50 boys in the U.S., it would have had to have been one in 20 boys, one in 10 boys at the time of Christ. And I don't think any of us believe that one-tenth of the male population had autism 2,000 years ago. And you can do the mathematics on that genetically, and you will come to the same conclusion that this cannot be, per se, a genetic disease, that the environment must be impacting the individual and the individual genes, but in a new way, a way that previously the environment didn't provide this insult to children. The prevalence data, this is from 2006, um, from May. It's changed since then. One in 89 boys in the U.S., if you dissect it out, these are 68-year-old boys, one in 89 and one in 267 girls. Um, if you look at this from February of 2007, this is the MMWR. The, uh, this is an updated study just six months later from the United States, looking at 14 sites. If you pick on New Jersey as an example, 
And one of the things that we know about autism is that it's not, the environment is not equally toxic or equally poisonous to people. And New Jersey has been a waste ground for New York for a long time. The prevalence in New Jersey is 16.8 boys per 1,000, or that is um, approximately 2% of boys in New Jersey have autism. Pretty horrific. And in England, is it any different? This is a study that was published in The Lancet in July of 2006. It's one in 54 boys, about 2%. Did you know it was that bad? There's a lot of people who aren't in this room that need to be in this room who have kids with autism that are home thinking that there's no hope because that's what they were told by their expert that they put their trust in. And those children will do poorly if they don't get help, if they don't get intervention. So inform your neighbors when you go back. One in 50, one in 50. You have to really get the word out about this. This is um, from Environmental Health Perspectives in July of 2000. It's not like this is news to us. Um, this is a, an interesting article talking about bordering on environmental disaster, and this is talking about third world nations. And we have exported much of our toxicity to um, third world countries so that they could manufacture the poisonous things for us. However, the global uh, environment is such that the trade winds, the, the water currents, bring it all back to roost with us. It gets into our fish, it gets into our birds, it gets into our atmosphere, and it's a real issue for us. That's my son, Matthew, when he was quite a bit younger, sitting on Grandpa's dock in Florida, um, fishing to remind us that one in six children in the U.S. anyway are born toxic to mercury because of maternal fish consumption and uh, maternal amalgams. So one in six children are born already toxic to mercury. That's about 600,000 children a year that meet the definition of toxic um, mercury levels at the time of birth based on cord bloods. There is no systematic approach to either the diagnosis of mercury toxicity in newborns, this, we don't screen for it, nor do we do anything about it, and it would be the ideal time to start intervening. And all of our siblings who are born um, of children with autism are screened for mercury toxicity if the parents let us do that in our practice. So the biomarker paper you have, which is on page 74 in your handout. You don't have to turn there, in, but you're welcome to, and you can make notes on it and look at it if you like. Um, we're going to go over it. Um, it's a reference that um, Dr. Rosingel and I put together to try and help you understand our thinking, and we picked out the key, what we think are the most productive uh, jewels in the biomarker concept. And for those of you who are not clinicians, a biomarker is a, is a laboratory test that a physician can order to give them insight into both the diagnosis and the treatment for a particular disorder. And a classic example of that would be glucose and diabetes. So if you wanted the doctor to manage your insulin without checking your glucose, that would be crazy, right? And yet we expect doctors to manage the biology of autism without looking, without checking, without having any sort of parameters to gauge the treatment and the intervention. And I don't think it's necessary anymore. We have good biomarkers. They're not the best. We would like better ones. But they're really, compared to where I started with this 10 years ago, these are pretty good biomarkers. So oxidative stress. We can measure oxidized RNA, and that's what 8-OHG is. Um, it's a simple, easy test in the urine. You can look at urinary isoprostane as well. There's a couple laboratories around that can do those for you. We uh, have currently been using Dr. Nataf's lab um, in Paris, and he can send kits anywhere in the world. It's a simple second um, morning urine test, and we use second morning urine because it doesn't change the isoprostane or the 8-OHG levels, and it's the best time to get porphyrins, and we'll talk about that. There's other things you can do, but um, those are primary um, testing. Ammonia would be really helpful. Lactic acid in some cases is very helpful. Reduced glutathione and oxidized glutathione, just really, practically speaking, you're not going to have access to those tests at this time. Methylation, it's really easy to get a fasting cysteine and methionine. Um, the chemistry for cysteine is standardized. Not all commercial or hospital laboratories use it, but it was published in 1999 by the NIH and CDC. And if you need a reference on uh, how they do that, and there's a simple kit for it, um, you can actually measure cysteine, which is the monomer of cysteine, an important um, thiol agent. And methionine, you can do fasting methionine. It's an amino acid that's an essential amino acid. And you'll know if that pathway is working. We'll talk about that pathway some more. Don't freak out that you don't know all those words right now. You will. Repetition is the key to learning. We'll go over this several times.